1913, Waldmar Lindgren published the book Mineral Deposits. That book laid the foundation for almost every study of mineral deposit classification ever since. He demonstrated that you could use the mineral assemblage and the textures of those minerals in mineral deposits to classify them according to the conditions of formation, both physical and chemical. The most useful mineral of all in that classification system is quartz, because quartz is a gang mineral in almost every mineral deposit and it has a very wide range of textures that vary according to its conditions of formation. That can help you a lot in exploration because when you understand the conditions that the deposit's formed under, you also understand the likely form of the deposit and the other chemical signatures that will go along with it. In the 1980s, Dr Greg Morrison and a group of students at James Cook University refined Lindgren's approach using detailed studies of quartz textures. So I'm here with Dr Greg Morrison, who's spent an extraordinary amount of time studying quartz textures and collecting specimens of them. And he's going to explain a little bit about why it's so important to understand what quartz textures there are and what they mean when you find them in an ore deposit. Can you tell me a little bit about how you came to study quartz textures and where you got to and how that process happened? Yeah, it all started uh, when I was doing regional metallogenic work initially in the Yukon and then here in Queensland. Mainly started with trying to follow up alluvial gold occurrences back to their source. The quartz was actually quite useful, so you could follow a train of particular kind of quartz upstream to see whether it came off an intrusion or out of a metamorphic rock. And then here in, in Queensland, when I first started metallogenic work in the early 80s, I realised that there was no systematic description of the deposits at, or of, of anything to do with the veins, really. and so. We just started making collections off the dumps and realised when we did that, that in particular areas you'd always get the same sort of combination of textures. So we built that into a sort of a formal framework that then we've used for 40 years really to classify deposits on the run. Uh, the beauty of that compared with a lot of the other methods is you can do it right there in the field and make the decisions in the field. You don't have to wait six months for the isotopes out of the zircon to tell you where it came from. And does that work in all environments or is it just the, the sort of uh, intrusive related things that we saw in, in North Queensland? No, it's, it's everything because all, virtually all <laughs> major deposit types have quartz in them and it's not restricted to gold or restricted to intrusion related things versus sediments. So we, you know, we have beautiful contrasts like that here between the intrusion related things around Chiligo for example versus in, in the nearby Hodgkinson which is an orogenic uh, belt where it had completely different kinds of quartz. Mm. But in the zone of overlap you can tell which is which. And in a lot of the orogenic deposits, it's turned out to be extremely useful to identify which ones are intrusion related and which ones are metamorphic because the intrusion related ones have distinctive quartz, but they also have free gold, whereas a lot of the orogenic ones have refractory gold with, with arsenic. And then in the Drummond Basin, of course, there's the epithermals where the quartz textures are important in the level you're at in that epithermal system. Yes, we, when we started that, that project after the discovery of Pajingo, we were looking in detail internally as well as helping all the other companies that were scrambling looking for more Pajingos, we realised that there was a systematic pattern in the epithermal textures and that proved to be an extremely valuable tool for evaluating epithermals. I, I've subsequently used that all over the world and uh, found it you know, as a, start, a starting point, very useful. It's, it's equivalent to the sort of the porphyry copper model that we have. It's a conceptual model of where things could be where you can test what you observe against a generalised model and then build your own model out of it to take care of the local peculiarities. And there are local peculiarities in, in every deposit <laughs> uh, in that zoning because of various overprinting <laughs> stages of fluid, etc, etc. Yeah, et but yeah. the broad picture is pretty much consistent. Isn't it? it is surprising how consistent it is and 
I think one of the important things we learned in Pajingo, for example, about the overprinting is that at any particular level, the overprinting is by similar sort of textures. So you can have a four phase breccia where the textures in each of four stages are essentially the same textures. That, that still helps you know where you are. Yeah. And obviously, you know, if you know what top and bottom look like, you can tell if it's collapsing or expanding system as well from the, the order in which things overprint. In a future series of videos, we'll look at Greg's suite of specimens to illustrate how to identify the quartz textures, the suites of textures that indicate environments of mineralisation, and how to interpret the vertical position in epithermal gold systems using the quartz textures.